This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. It's 21 questions here on KC Sports Network's channels. Thank you, everyone, for listening, watching, wherever you're consuming this. I am Ken Swanson. I am quite excited to be hanging out with my dear pal, the ever so smirky Jordy Foot today. Jordan, you're like happy today, buddy. We we had some jokes and inside stuff off air that's always a good time. Me and Kent like to crack jokes and have fun. And I'm hoping we have some fun here, man, because it's been a minute since I jumped on one of these with you. Yeah, it's been I'm starting to think it's been a while since uh since we've done this show together. Uh Jordy, of course, is on one royal way. You can hear that uh with Joel Penfield and Josh Kaiser every single week here on KCSN's channels as well. Uh, but this is our chance to answer the questions of all of the listeners of KC Sports Network. How do you ask these questions? Well, you go to the Discord, the KCSN Discord, which is a uh, one of the features that we have added for the KCSN Substack. You get access to the KCSN Discord. It's a really fun community. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Chiefs fans are on there hanging out at any given time. And there's a section where you can ask all the questions for 21 questions. So this is where we do that. And we're going to get right into them. S Wallaby 13. If Kadarius Tony is on the roster but isn't going to play, what are some players that you think can clear waivers for a seventh wide receiver slot until Tony is either back or on IR? So I really Jordy, I really wanted to just get into this question because I don't think wide receiver seven is necessarily like a need. I think it's more of a choice if they feel compelled to keep a seventh wide receiver because of the players that are on the roster. I think that's more the vein of of how this happens rather than like going out of your way to try to identify an additional receiver to throw into the mix for this room. I think it's most likely seven receivers. If they really just, they just love all the guys that they have. I don't know if you feel any differently. Yeah, no, I think it's the same thing. And like the only guy that I would have brought up is Denzel Mims. Obviously, that kind of got extinguished back when that whole situation was going on. And he wouldn't have been a seventh uh, wide receiver. And for the Chiefs, they have guys internally, a Nico Romijo, a Justin Ross, that if they want to have that extra receiver, they can keep it. Um, I wouldn't look on the margins of any other team, really. And the thing with Ross is if he is healthy and the Chiefs do put him on the practice squad, He'll get poached. He will get poached because you can't go squad to squad, but you can go squad to a 53-man roster. If he is healthy, some team will believe in his talent and take that chance. We're probably going to talk about the uh, final 53-man later on and whether they keep seven wideouts. That's the decision they're going to have to make. But I don't think they have to look externally. If Tony's missing the first couple weeks of the year, you just keep somebody you already have on the roster, bring him up, and let him play. The wonderful Christian Gumminger, uh, he of the KCSN Foundation, who just did an unbelievable job of putting together the KCSN Foundation golf tournament. We raised a ton of money. I don't know if they've released the numbers yet, but thank you, thank you, thank you all so much for coming to the tournament, for um, donating all kinds of, you know, donating your money. Just the the generosity is just unbelievable. We We can't appreciate you enough. Anyways, he asked the question. Mom's contract is a few years old now. Are you guys surprised no other team has used the same structure as the Chiefs did with their quarterback? Uh, ignoring the 10 years, why haven't teams used the guaranteed structure as precedent with big-time contracts? Uh, you, you go first, Jordan. I have, I, plenty, I have plenty of thoughts. I don't think you can ignore the 10-year element because that's just a once-in-a-generation type thing, and it's for a once-in-a-generation type player. And as much as I think Josh Allen is absolutely awesome, and at his peak, he can reach some of the heights Patrick Mahomes gets to, as much as I like Joe Burrow and think he's one of the top three to five quarterbacks in the NFL that's going to be good for a long time, as much as I like a Justin, uh, or not Justin Fields, a Jalen Hurts, Justin Herbert, those guys are talented. Mahomes is Mahomes. The Chiefs knew very early on he was going to be their guy, He's brought the team to heights that other teams and young quarterbacks haven't been able to reach. This is unprecedented territory, and it's an unprecedented deal for him. So without going too far down the path of like, hey, fully guaranteed stuff and the 10-year structure and then the the team flexibility with the cap, I think the simple answer is he is just on a different level, and that's kind of where it stems from. 
I think there was a lot of people upset with how the Chiefs did that contract, if you remember, too. A lot of people were really mad at how the Chiefs structured that. Um, a lot of agents were really disappointed and upset with how the Chiefs structured that. And it, you know, like the Chiefs made their choices on, you know, they they got really, really creative and like the 10-year element's a big piece of that for sure. Um, you know, and I think I I feel like, you know, maybe there maybe not everyone is wanting to commit 10 years to all these guys. Not that not that none of these players that we're talking about aren't worth a 10-year deal. It's just there's little caveats to some of these guys that have gotten these deals recently. Josh Allen, the, the play style, is he going to be able to hold up? Joe Burrows had a season ending injury already. Jalen Hurts, same thing, running style. I don't don't know if you want to commit 10 years because if you know the, the running element falls off, then there's going to be problems there. Justin Herbert's probably the guy that you could point to and say, hey, maybe this is a team that'd be willing to, you know, to to commit 10 years to, but he hasn't done it. What's he done? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, talent's yeah. ridiculous. So I don't know. I think there's a little bit of both, you know, those kind of things there, but uh, and, and and Mahomes had to be willing to take the deal he took and everybody's getting all beat up about, oh, the fact that, you know, Patrick Mahomes took this deal. Who, who cares? Patrick Mahomes wanted to take that deal. He wants to win Super Bowls. He's already won two. And all the guys that you just got, into, we just got done talking about haven't done anything yet. They haven't won a Super Bowl. How many playoff wins do some, like, how many playoff wins do we have between that group? Yeah, exactly. You know, we have a yeah. but you get the point. Uh, he did, no rings. Mahomes just keeps, <laughs> Mahomes keeps, keeps going from that. Uh, Casey from KC, have you listened to the Play Callers podcast series yet? And any meaning takeaways? Have you listened to this yet at all, Jordy? Yes, which is a surprise because I don't listen to anything. I don't watch anything. I don't listen to anything. But um, Jordan Rodriguez, she covers the Rams for The Athletic. And she does a really good job just doing that. But also is like the host of this show. And it shows like the beginnings of the Shanahan McVay scheme, like the offense and the storytelling with like sound bites for them. Like the whole thing is just really neat and something that at first I was like, eh, this won't live up to the hype. It won't be very cool. Um, but I remember we talked with Maddie about it and even Maddie who he could be skeptical of some stuff. He was like, this is objectively a, a pretty cool little uh, setup they had. So I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was fantastic. I listened to all of it and um, it's interesting to kind of see the dynamics between all those guys and the expectations and the standards. Like, I think you kind of get an idea of why Kyle Shanahan might be difficult to work with for whatever you want to say. The dynamic between him and Sean McVay, where neither of them really want to, you know, like there's a lot of theft in the NFL, right? It doesn't seem like either of them want to steal from each other because that's almost like admitting the other one, had, you know, had something mm -hmm. the other yeah. one did it. Um, you know, like just so many unique different things. It was cool to see that tree grow and, they all definitely have their own personalities and the way they're able to kind of put their own personality on what they do, I think was just, it's so, so fascinating. It was such a great kind of, honestly, I think it was one of the first football things I've really listened to in a long time, just cause I, I've started, yeah, I, it, I, I like to, I need to cool down on some of the football stuff from time to time. And candidly, I don't really listen to a ton of football stuff as it is anyway, just because, you know, I don't, with, with this gig you, you don't you want your own takes to be your own takes anyway so especially non-cheap stuff like it's tough to to consume there's 32 teams 32 storylines probably you know multiple per team it's just tough I, I tend to when i'm when i'm uh when i'm wanting to listen to nfl or football content it tends to be draft stuff because just to kind of get names on the list you know it's like oh, okay so this guy from you know this edge rushers, you know, let's let's check him kind of stuff. So yeah, yep. that's where, where it tends to go for me. Joel Penfield. Oh, hey, you know that name a little bit, Jordy. Uh, he asks, which rookies uh, hype train does Jordan Foot hate the most? I don't hate. So <laughs> I, I'll explain it, even though everyone probably already knows. Last year when the Isaiah Pacheco trade or not trade, I just saw a notification about a trade when the Isaiah Pacheco pick happened and the offseason was unfolding. I was like, hey, yes, he's talented. Yes, he also has some holes in his game. No, he's not going to be RB1 right out of the gate. So let's like pump the brakes a little bit and let him earn the hype. And then he did. And everything was fine. But the non-early adoptive this of that, everyone was like, oh, you hate Isaiah Pacheco, blah, blah, blah. And I think this year for me, it's probably Rasheed Rice. And like the Chiefs rookie class, just because the roster is so good, hasn't had a ton of standouts at camp just because last year they invested in this youth movement, let them get the hype, let them get the reps this year. Not a ton. 
Rasheed Rice has been great in camp so far by all accounts. He started off by throwing up and everyone made a big deal about it. He is someone I didn't really care for leading up to the draft. I didn't like him with the profile. I didn't like the pick. I didn't like the Chiefs moving up a little bit to get him. But he's made almost everyone eat crow. Again, it's in camp. He hasn't had a game yet, um, preseason or regular season. But I guess to go with the theme, I, I'd pick Rasheed Rice. Jay the Fan asks, if you put Andy Reid as the Chargers head coach, Sean Payton as the Chiefs head coach, and Kyle Shanahan as the Broncos head coach, how does the division play out? Uh, Mahomes still figures it. Well, it's not even figured out. Sean Payton's still a good play caller. He's still a good offensive mind. He's still a good coach. And having the trump card of of Patrick Mahomes, I think Peyton still wins out. Uh, Andy Reid is in, I think Andy Reid and the Chargers, and then Shani and Russell Wilson. Because I mean, yeah. Shani and Russell, especially after listening to that podcast, imagine Shani and Russell. Whew! That would It'd be disgusting. It'd it be would, great for us, but like disgusting for everybody else. Russell wouldn't make it. He just no. wouldn't make it. And I think but, Kyle would just be like, I don't, yeah, fine. We're going to bench you. We're going to play. Who's Denver, yeah. Who's Denver's backup? He'd get uh, like league average production out of him for half know. a year. Like, he'd put Michael Burton there at some point. Yeah. Like it's just, be, it'd, be, <laughs> it'd be ridiculous. Chiefs, Chief 8120. Does the quality of the back seven on defense give Veach faith to play hardball with Chris Jones? I don't think really like I, I know that having a better defense definitely makes you possibly think twice about like, Hey, what does it look like without this guy? But Chris Jones is such a high caliber player. I don't think you really factor that in. And when the chiefs traded Tyree kill, they had Travis Kelsey, they had Patrick Mahomes, they had Andy Reed. Steve Spagnuolo is a good coach. The chiefs have good players elsewhere on defense, but like they don't have that equivalent talent outside of Chris Jones. He is that talent so i know that the linebacking core is going to be good the secondary is young cost controlled for the most part but i'm not sure you can totally say hey if we get rid of chris jones we can make up the difference elsewhere because still that void at the interior defensive line spot you're not going to be able to fill that back sevens are can it's great to have a good back seven but it's still all about those guys up front too and like that back seven doesn't look as good without chris jones i don't think either so I think that's where things get tricky, too. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more of your questions right after this. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. Entertain. Educate. Inform. KC Sports Network. Thanks, everybody listening. Thanks, everybody, for supporting KC Sports Network. Feel free to hit that like button, that subscribe button. Feel free to leave a five-star review and help us continue to grow KCSN and help get the word out to more Chiefs fans like yourself. Bones Jackson uh, asks, uh, you might, can't, he says specifically me, you might be the most KC person I asked a question to. Outside of the Negro Leagues Museum, which I already plan on visiting, what is the most to-do thing to do while I bring my foreign almost girlfriend to KC during the week before Thanksgiving to town. Um, So Thanksgiving time, that time of year is actually, I think peak Plaza time. It's gorgeous down there. Yep. Now the lights aren't going to be, the, the lights aren't going to be out yet because the lights get turned on, I believe on Thanksgiving night. So you're still not going to have the lights up, but you know, fall at uh, at the plaza is just a really fun place, especially as a couple. Like, that's a really fun place to go. Um, so, like, that would be one of my, like, biggest things. I think I would, you know, if if I'm bringing my lady friend out, you know, if I'm, if I were you, I think that's what I, I think that's what I do. Uh, Jordy, do you have any other, do you have any other thoughts? I mean, you're a KC guy too. So, yeah. So, my answer is twofold. The first one is I get a lot of my recommendations for stuff to do from Kent for better or worse. <laughs> and, and they usually, he hasn't steered me wrong. A lot of it's food, but like Kent gives good advice and recommendations. But secondly, anywhere with like a good view, like the top of the World War One monument, like overseeing Kansas City, that looks mm -hmm. good. City Hall has an observation deck on the very top floor. I haven't checked it out yet, but I've seen some pictures online. They look awesome. You check in with security, go up there, take pictures, do whatever you want. Anywhere where you can see stuff in Kansas City. And that's like early for Christmas type festivities, obviously, but still getting outdoors. The weather shouldn't be too bad. Knock on wood. I know it's hard to predict, but getting out there, 
if you're staying away from barbecue, that's the obvious answer. But go in and seeing stuff, really take Kent's advice, go to the plaza, do all that stuff because it's going to be a good time. Uh, I'm looking, I'm, I'm Googling this and searching this for you, Bones. Uh, the Sound of Music might be in town at the Kaufman Center. Like, I think the Kaufman Center would be a fun would yeah. be a fun place to go um there, there looks like there might be some stuff going on just for like that's that'd be a fun place to kind of to kind of go as well um crown centers kind of you know that's a fun vibe that time of year too okay seasonality has has definitely has a play in there so there's some stuff yeah. that i do zach tuttle if you put your gm hats on what would you give up in a trade come draft time to go way up and get marvin harrison jr so have you thought about this one, Jordy? Because I have. Some- I've thought a lot. I've thought a lot about it, I think. Okay. Well, then let's let you go first. Okay. So when the Chiefs traded up for Mahomes, obviously it was only to 10. They gave up 27.91 and the next year's first round pick. Mm-hmm. Now I do that for Marvin Harrison Jr., but he won't last until 10. So I went to the Bridge Hill chart for this coming year, 31.63. Plus, so what would next year's first be worth? Because I didn't find the numerical value. Do so, you subtract 20 points? How much is the... to tip, Typically, the rule of thumb is uh, take a round out, take a round off. So next year's okay. first is roughly worth the value of 63. So that changes a lot because I was like, well, maybe it's worth 150 instead of 190. And that yeah. math got me up to 446, which would have been number six. That completely changes it. Um, I'd give up a lot for him because I like – no prospect is 1000% guaranteed to have a good NFL career, but he's so damn good <laughs> and he's going to be so damn good for a long time. I'd give up multiple first round picks, like at least two. I'd give up a second. If I had to throw a third in there, I'd give up a third. Now that I don't have the math to back it, I'd give up a ton without absolutely crippling myself in the draft for the next few years. And I know that's kind of a vague answer. So the Chiefs probably have to give up just if draft in draft capital to make the the math work to get let's say it's pick number three let's say it's caleb williams and it's drake may off the top you're looking at the entire draft class for 2024 uh or every draft pick you're looking at every draft pick in 2024 you're looking at your first and second for 2025 probably and maybe your third if you're looking yeah. at, if you're doing the draft math all that to be said it's going to require giving up players mm-hmm. maybe you can maybe you can it'd be like chris jones in a first and a second and probably like it's a ridiculous like i think it'd be a ridiculous amount and i think this is where I, this is where it gets tricky, and this is why you you've you've I don't think you've ever seen something like this before, where a team's trading all the way back, the way that that would be required. You don't see teams go from the very very back of the first all the way to the front, and there's some ridiculous trades and some aggressive trades that were made to get from like ten to three, I you know like the Texans or twelve to three or whatever the Texans just did. Like, think about that just to go nine spots, just to, you know, to get all the way up there. And then you have to, the team has to, the, 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 the team trading away has to be willing to do it. Yeah. Marvin Harrison is a generational talent. It would require an absurd amount of capital and probably players. I genuinely, I, I say all that to say, genuinely don't think the Chiefs would be even able no way. Yeah. To, pull that, to pull that off uh zach Minarax, our guy uh he did a phenomenal job uh at sunflower hills uh, wait i don't know if i'm supposed to be saying i don't know if i'm giving away him yeah way to give it away ken but he, he did a great job at the tournament yesterday favorite club to skull <laughs> over the green it i think it's my 52 degree wedge and like my chipping it's very consistent for the day which is weird because like hold the hole i'm a pretty consistent player it's because if I'm feeling it that day, I'm going to feel it for the whole round. And I'm usually a back nine player, but still the 52 degree, I'm known for putting way too much on it and my chips inside. So if I'm a hundred yards out, right? A hundred to 50, I'm generally okay. Anything inside 50 yards, I have no control over what's happening. And I either leave it way short 
or I, you know, skull it way over the green. So it's definitely my trusty, not trusty 52. Yeah, I think it's my 52. I don't pull it out of the bag very much. I normally just like, you know, I, I, I try not to take I try not to. I'll just like I'll I'll play my pitch a little bit lighter or so I'll, I'll put 85 on an 85 percent swing or something on yep. the pitch instead. It's like it's, it's a club I avoid because I do just. Yeah, I kind of skull it pretty bad. So I haven't figured that one out. Positive a toasty. Which of the following is most likely to get a head coaching gig over the next couple of years? Spags, Nagy, or Tobe? I think there's so, one answer. I think there's one answer personally. I, I don't think know. it's got to be Matt Nagy, right? Yeah, I think it's the only answer. The other two have been open about their desire, but like it's not going to happen. No, I don't think. And it, this isn't knocking Spags or Tobe. No, not at guys all. Guys are both. They're a lot older. They've both been through the process. Spags has had a chance to be a head coach. I, I know it didn't go great for him. I think both of those guys are lifer coordinators from now on. Matt Nagy has the best ch- shot. He's still very young, very young. Um, he's in his 40s. Um, and he really didn't have that bad of a stretch in Chicago, candidly. I mean, he won coach of the year. So, yeah. I I think Matt Nagy's sticking around to 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 be Mahomes. I think he's the head coach in wing personally. Like that's I not or anything. That's just a guess. Uh it makes way too much sense for Matt Nagy and Brett Veach to be a, a power duo after Andy leaves. Like they're both buddies and play together and all that stuff. So that would be my guess. Um Mike Denny, if both of you were driving a golf ball in front of 50 people. Would the other person slice it more or less than 30 yards? So I think how intoxicated are we? I is don't this know. stone cold sober? I think this is a stone cold sober question. Okay. Um, I'm including a snap hook as a slice. Like I'm just going to assume either direction because I don't want to get technical. I am pulling or pushing that ball definitely 30 yards the wrong way in either direction so the answer for me i would do worse than you um i've only seen you swing a golf club twice and neither one of them were great yeah exactly i hooked i hooked both i hooked a couple yesterday pretty bad and uh i mean it wasn't my club no that's what did you see did you see me swing with the pxgs i did yeah that one i did hit yeah i hit that one real good yeah, actually, so did. like I teed off, I teed off, and I said, "Hey, look, if you give me this, if you let me tee off, I'll this could be like your fifth shot in your scramble for one of the teams." I did that twice, sure. hooked yeah. one. <laughs> uh, I don't think you were there for that one. Uh, but then on the with the PXG driver, I just just down the middle is pretty sick. I was pretty happy with it. But I, yeah, I mean, I, I really, I, I was, it was really hard for me to be there and not play. But I did have a phenomenal time hanging out with everybody and stuff. Don't get me wrong. It was just like I. <laughs> It, it it uh I had the urge all day. I had that yeah, I had that itch. I had that itch the entire day. Lee 87. Uh Kent and Jordan, if you had to look out for realistic targets for a midseason trade as of now, who are you targeting? Do you have any, Jordy? I have three, and like two of them have already been lumped into Chiefs conversations a lot. Chase Young and then Daniil Hunter. Mm-hmm. I know Hunter just got his contract like reworked a little bit to where he's up to like 20 million this year. So that changes the calculus quite a bit. Um, I was thinking, so Mike Evans has been brought up with the Chiefs and not like linked to him, but like in conversations, oh, if the, the Buccaneers go south, Mike Evans could be traded, blah, blah, blah. I think I like Russell Gage would be like a more realistic trade piece. But like if the Chiefs are needing Russell Gage midseason, that means their right. wideout room objectively sucks. And I, I don't think that's uh, – that could be the case, but they're not going to have him save their season. So probably – Chase Young is always going to be the big fish on Chiefs Twitter for like a midseason guy. Um, otherwise, you're like trying to look into the future and think who would get pissed off, who would get hurt, what what need arises. So that's that's probably my three. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you know those are the oh, those are the obvious ones, but yeah, you just hope that doesn't doesn't resort to that for the receiver position. You know, like and honestly, I, I, there's some reason for optimism there. If I'm being honest, sure. Matthew McNabb, there are several positions where we think the chiefs might bring in a vet. Who are some guys that you think could perform well enough in camp to take the spot? We think a, a vet would take. I've actually written about this a little bit. Um, I think at the edge position, you know, like you're looking at BJ Thompson and Joshua Kando and 
uh, you know, obviously you've got Felix and DK Zama, who's a lock, but like, I think those guys, if, if they all, if, if the young guys at defensive end spot are continuing to play well, then they're not going to go look for a, a Carlos Dunlap type, you know, just, they're just going to roll with some of the guys that they have. Um, I don't know if there's that many positions that the chiefs could add a vet though. I actually don't think it's very many. Like, there's no receiver that's moving the needle, and I'd rather just see these young guys get opportunities at like a receiver spot. Outside of that, I mean, same with tackle. Same, I mean, there's really, I mean, there's not a ton. You know, it's maybe, maybe you look to add a an edge rusher, and even then, it's you know, I think it's that young edge group taking another step. Yeah, I think so too, and maybe even like only because the team's been quiet about him and no one's been talking about him. And sometimes that is even an indicator that things are going well. You know what I mean? Like the yeah. Chiefs try to keep some guys off the radar. Sherman Jones hasn't been talked about much. Maybe they do like him at defensive end. Like they have so many bodies there. I think adding a veteran wouldn't hurt. Don't get me wrong. But assuming Chris Jones is going to be out there on the field, assuming Keandre Coburn's going to get worked in there a little bit, assuming Andrew DK Uzama plays somewhat of a role his rookie year with the addition of a Menehu with Carl Loftus being a little bit more consistent. They don't have a ton of guys right now that can move the needle. They've invested in the youth movement for better or worse at a lot of spots. And that's probably what they're going to have to roll with until like we said, mid season, maybe reevaluate, but I don't think it's really going to happen. You can reevaluate all of your life choices after, while this break goes on. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. Entertain. Educate. Inform. KC Sports Network. Those life choices are going great for all of you. Thank you, everybody that's hanging out. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Feel free to uh, leave a five-star review. If you are so inclined, uh, our buddy Charles Goldman asks which member of the KCSN crew would be the best slam ball player. I think there's just like a clear cut tier one player. I I think there's two. Is Craig one of is Craig the one that you're thinking of? Is it no, Maddie? It's Maddie. I was thinking Maddie, and then I thought of how tall Craig is and like how great he is, and someone would get overwhelmed with how great he is and then be scared. So it's I Maddie think, and Craig. I think I think Maddie's like the perfect combination of just physicality, density, and fearlessness. Where I first think, one like, in, last one out. Yeah, I think I just wouldn't want to run into Maddie at the uh, at the rim. Don't tell him I told told you that. Yeah. Lee Tucker was a little taller though. He he'd get honorable mention, but he's, yeah, he's not he's taller. Got, he's so. got he's got to have the handles too. Yeah, Maddie's definitely a guy. Like you're not trying to Maddie's not, you're not trying to ask Maddie to dribble. Uh, no way. You're asking him to <laughs> run and jump on the trampoline. Lee eighty seven. How great is Jordan behind the scenes? Any great stories on messages he sends out while you all recording? Uh, okay. So Jordy used to produce for us, and I'll just be candid with you guys. We have some absolutely killer producers at KC Sports Network. Like mm -hmm. genuinely, like Jordy, yeah. you did a fantastic job. Don't tell Nick I said this, who's producing the show right now, also does a fantastic job. The stories on messages he sends out while we're recording. Nope. Uh, <laughs> nope. Nope. He's nope. Those aren't getting out. Um, but I, all of our like all of our producers do such a good job of um like they kind of they they the best thing a producer can do is pay attention and good producers will hear what's happening. will analyze what's happening on the show and try to see if there's any p particular context that they can give to help facilitate the conversation. Nick, Jordy, Tucker, they all do a really good job of like, if there's something one of us says, they might go look up further statistics on it or something like that to kind of try to help facilitate the conversation. Um, so we, we've been really lucky with a lot of great producers at KCSN and I'm not just saying that, uh, Nick, you can keep your ear shut though. Um, on this one, you know, don't be a good listener for once, Nick. Um, but yeah, no, like we've got, we've got some, we got some great dudes out here. It's been really fun. KC from KC. If the chiefs traded Chris Jones now, what should be the expected return? You got one. I got some thoughts. I literally, so DeForest Buckner went for what the, 13th, 13th pick. overall pick and he was due for an extension so i think 
and I think we had this conversation last year at some point, like uh, in the Discord or on Twitter. Um, people, it was a, a widespread. Is he worth the first round pick? Are you getting that? And that was before he turned in the defensive player of the year caliber campaign. But now he's also a year older. I'm thinking like. Is a one and a three too much or not enough? Like, I think he's definitely worth a first round pick. And then you try to factor in what else you get for him. And I know that he is due for an extension, but like, with how this stuff works, I'd be surprised if the team gave all that up and then didn't extend him. Like, usually the news breaks that he gets traded. Then 20 minutes later, Rappaport's like, oh, yeah. And it comes with an extension for blah, 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 blah. So I think a one and a three, and that is probably what I would settle on, I think. Be like a one and a pick swap type thing. So maybe the Chiefs get a three, they give up a four or something like that. Uh, I think that's what you're aiming for. The, like I don't know if the I don't love the DeForest Buckner parallels for Chris just because of like DeForest was younger. He was on his first extension. Chris Ballard was pretty aggressive and and all that stuff. If the Chiefs trade him before the season, I'll be uh, I'll be distraught. Like I think that's 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 if they trade him before the season, and I, again, I will be st- unbelievably stunned if that happens. I think you're looking at, I mean, they've, they've spent an offseason building a team around him uh, and, and planning on him being here and then and then and doing that. Um, I think you're getting a first, though. Like, I do think you're yeah. getting a first for him. And But yes, the, the trade would coincide with an extension by the team acquiring him, 100%. Now it's, I mean, they're, they're paying them the second most money in the history of the NFL for a defensive tackle if they're doing it. So I don't know how big of a market there's going to be this time of year either. Uh, if we're being honest, B Higgs asks if Netflix were to make another quarterback style docu series about the NFL, would you prefer a head coach or general manager and who sticks out as someone you would want to see? So if they went back, cause like the first episode, if I remember correctly, of quarterback was like, the Chiefs Bucks Super Bowl. If they went back that far, I would want Green Bay and Gutkunst and, and Aaron Rodgers, kind of like that whole dynamic of everything. I'd want um, John Lynch in San Francisco, Howie Roseman in Philly. Uh, what's Buffalo? Is Bean up in Buffalo? Yep. You know, I, I'd want, yeah, I think because you have, you'd be more hard pressed, I think, to find that type of access to a GM. Like, I could never see Brett Veach doing something like that. I could never really see any of these guys doing it. Head coach would be fun, don't get me wrong. But I think if you do GM, you would also get, by default, some access to the head coach as well. I think the, I think the GM one would be... What would make it to Netflix would be really not super that's, interesting that's during, the, during the season. So, like, I think the most exciting times to watch would be free agency and the draft. I The answer for me is like a following the scouting department and the GM around for the draft. Like, I think that would be a lot of fun. Head coach, they've actually uh, sneak go Bill Belichick. They followed Bill Belichick around mm-hmm. one year. Yeah. And so you can watch like a very good perspective from Bill Belichick, which is one of the most, it's very interesting. Like there was like, they followed him around for an entire season. And there's some really cool sound bites with him and Tom, like their meetings. There's a cool, like some interactions where Randy Moss is trying to get Bill Belichick to go to their Halloween party. Like there's, it's good. Like it's really good. So they, you kind there's, there is some of that perspective there. You can actually kind of get a view of that, but I mean like pre-draft GM Netflix documentary would be pretty sweet. Yeah. It'd be a lot of fun. Uh, Z man, if nothing gets done with Chris Jones and Legarius Sneed is, uh, or and and Sneed, or if if nothing gets done with CJ and Legarius Sneed is allowed to walk, does Pat start to question his contract and structure and go after top APY? Good question. I'll let you take this one. Go ahead. I think Patrick Mahomes is very aware and informed of everything, and I kind of, I'll I'll be honest with you. Till a couple weeks ago, Z Man, or recently, I was kind of, you know, wondering the same kind of questions. But Craig or Maddie made a really good point that, you know, Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes have not been super aggressive in trying to main, main, maintain themselves as the highest paid players. And they've given a little bit to try to keep the band together. 
And so if those guys, you know, Chris and Legarius aren't doing the same thing to try to continue to keep the band together, which is in their rights to do so, then I think it might be an easier sell for, you know, Pat and Chris or Pat and Travis uh, to not, not be too aggressive about that. If they're seeing everybody else not being willing to do what they're doing, willing to do. Um, so I think that dynamic could be fine. And again, like I think the Chiefs are really good from all indications about staying in touch with Patrick about a lot of stuff as they should. Uh, it's a very good, strong partnership, at least on the outside looking in between Andy, Pat, GM, owner, all that. So I think I, I in a vacuum, I could see it. But like, I think if you look farther in, into more of the context, like I think they'd be fine. And Pat Mahomes would understand and they'd go figure out how to crush it life after Chris. There, and here's the thing. And I, I say this all the time. There is going to be a life after Chris Jones. It's just a matter of when. And there's going to be a life after Chris Jones, the elite defensive tackle. And who knows when that's going to be. So you're going to have to plan for it at some point. At some point. So it's either have the assets and the cash to do something now, or it's figure everything out with different assets, you know, later. What? Who knows? So uh, I don't know if you got anything else on that. I think like from a fan and media perspective, whichever side of the coin people fall on, you go back to the Tyree kill thing and like how they didn't pay that guy top tier money. And they went with the youth movement. They saved some cash there. If you do that, then do it with Chris Jones, then to a much larger or smaller scale, even though the secondary is loaded, do it with luxurious need. Then you're like, okay, well, the Chiefs are just cutting costs with some players. That ignores, though, they paid Joe Tooney a ton of money back in the day. They paid Javon Taylor a premium contract this offseason. Like, the Chiefs are not scared to pay people. The trend with Hill was top-of-the-market money, age close to 30 or 28, whatever he was, closing in on 30 during that contract, surpassing 30. Like, people would question it, but I don't think Patrick Mahomes would. And if he did, I don't think he'd bring it to the Chiefs. It'd be like, hey, okay, so I'm taking less the team is cutting a couple quarters, but then the guys that are subsequent, Hey, we should keep them. They're letting them walk too. That's a little bit weird, but I don't see the chiefs ever turning into necessarily a green Bay Aaron Rodgers situation where you're just literally nothing's happening. Right. The communication breaks down. Like the chiefs are so structurally intact and like sound in that regard. I don't think it'd ever be a big deal. Uh, C Bones asks, how has Donovan Smith looked? A couple of bad clips, not being uh, much being said about him. I think not much being said about him is actually a really good sign. And I think the clips you've seen for the most part aren't anything of, of worry. Like there's been, I think you've heard some guys talk about the one-on-ones in Andy Reid training camps and Andy Heck training camps are not always, you know, a very cut and dry. There's, just, there's so much context to this sport and they might be yeah. working on one specific thing and, you know, and honestly, like one of the reps that people are, you know, really upset about, like I, 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 I'm not too beat up about it. No news is good news, I think, with Donovan Smith, and I don't think we've heard too much about him yet. Now, there's going to be some elite pass rushers that he's going to be playing that he hasn't really had a chance to see, and this isn't knocking the Chiefs guys, but they just don't have a, you know, a elite edge player. They have a lot of really good, solid depth, uh, and, and quality players. So, you know, there's still time, but yeah, I'm not worried about donovan smith from what we've seen at this point and hopefully he's having a really strong rebound yeah with an andy reed andy heck training camp if those drills are sometimes conducive and designed for the defensive player to to do something good and to win and like if donovan smith is getting routinely beat by guys in training camp he shouldn't be in the nfl and that applies to anybody like it doesn't matter until he gets into a game situation in the regular season and is healthy and 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 he's doing well or doing bad like right now he could have been having one of the best camps of his life wouldn't really think too much of it he could be having one of the worst camps of his life and unless he was you know morbidly out of shape or getting absolutely destroyed wouldn't be alarmed so i don't think a couple uh, cherry picked clips or just happenstance is going to change anyone's idea of him um, it really does not move me until he gets out there in the regular season. Seems like the Chiefs are happy with what they got so far, though. So that's always good to see. Thanik asks, who is having the best camp so far? And I, again, candidly, I haven't been out for practice yet. I've been able to you know, see what I can see, hear what I can hear. Uh, 
I have heard, and this is, I mean, I've heard good things about, you know, Daenerys Prince and Rashi Rice. Those are two guys that have had really good camps by all indications. Those are guys that I'm very excited to get eyes on here in the near future. Um, so I think those are two of the leading candidates. Um, yeah, and good for them. Like, that's awesome. I don't know if you've heard it. It's, it's still early. There hasn't been a ton of padded practices yet either. So there's always that. But anything, anybody else for you, Jordy? It's Ross, Rice, and Prince. Those are the top three. Like defensively, they had some guys, and unfortunately, Nazi Johnson was yeah. one of them that was having a really good camp before yeah. he unfortunately tore his ACL um, and will be out for the year. It's really an offense centric kind of hype train so far. And it's those three guys that we've talked about. K Govinger asks, is Justin Ross a thing or a meme? Thing or meme? That's a new game. Is he a thing or a meme? He is a thing for the folks that are just embracing his talent and acknowledging he is a fun football player. And if he makes the team, it is a success. The meme that is still out there, though, is the people tweeting he's going to be wide out one. He's going to have, you know, 800 yards. He's going to be getting a ton of reps over. He's not going to be wide receiver one, two, three, or four. Probably not five if he does make the team. And like it is just so hard to see him making a big impact in what is effectively year one for him, even though it's technically year two. So like it's a thing with him being healthy, hopefully for the sake of the player and the team and making the team potentially. But the meme is like doing anything beyond that. I just don't see the path. And it's not his fault. It's because again, the Chiefs threw numbers at the position and he's kind of on the outside looking in for the second straight year. Making the team makes him a thing. That's the bar. Anything after that's great. I think he's a thing. I'm buying it. Um, it I, I, I said this on the radio though too at the same time. It's tricky for him. And I think the Kadarius Tony injury helps Justin Ross a little bit. You get a little bit more creative maybe with your roster. Justin Ross isn't a special teams contributor and the bottom of the roster receivers are typically those type of guys, those special teams contributors. So um, there's not a ton of those true, you know, there's not a Byron Pringle, Marcus Kemp type special teams contributor on the, in the bottom of the wide receiver room. Justin Watson has some special teams value. Richie James has some special teams value. I know Justin Ross has like tried to do some return stuff, but that's where it gets tricky for him to make the roster. But if he continues to push and push and show so much as a receiver, I think he can help, you know, formulate the strategy around that room, force his hand a little bit to get onto the roster. And maybe you look a little bit more at Justin Watts, Justin Watts getting more snaps on special teams. You look at, you know, because the workload, maybe the workload doesn't wind up being as much for Justin Watson and Richie James because Justin Watson's eating that. You know, there's a lot of ways that this can play out, but. I think Justin Watt or I think Justin Ross will I think he's gonna make the team. I feel good about it where we're at today. And I think the hype continues to build for him. And that's exciting. Cause if we've talked about Rashi, we've talked about Rashi, we talked about Justin Ross, we've talked about um Daenerys Prince. Like these are a lot of really a lot of young guys that if they're able to continue to stack these young cost control players. Whew, yeah, big time. It's a yep. game changer. It's an absolute game changer. Uh, that is it for 21 questions. Thank you all so much for listening so much for supporting KC sports network. Make sure you subscribe and check out everything that's going to be going on on KCSN's channel the rest of the week and all season. Thank you guys so much. We'll catch you later.